Before the success or failure of the Trinity test, President Harry Truman made his decision to use the bomb on Japan as soon as it was ready. We shall completely destroy Japan's power to make war. We've now traveled back to the National World War II Museum to uncover what happened after the successful detonation of the gadget in the desert of New Mexico. Hi everyone, my name is Jasmine Gray and I'm a student from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Right now I'm here with Dr. Kristen Burton. She is the museum educator and we're here on the Road to Tokyo Gallery to learn more about the story. Dr. Kristen, what influenced President Truman to move forward with the weapon? Well, Jasmine, it's important to keep in mind that Truman, who was vice president under Roosevelt, had no previous knowledge about the Manhattan Project. So when FDR passed away on April 12, 1945, and Truman then became president of the United States, he very quickly had to be brought up to speed. So on April 25th, he met with an interim committee that consisted of key scientists who worked on the Manhattan Project, including J. Robert Oppenheimer and Enrico Fermi. And based on those meetings with this committee, Truman learned about the Manhattan Project, the atomic bomb, as well as potential uses for this new powerful weapon. Simultaneously, the U.S. military was also planning an amphibious landing on one of the Japanese home islands of Kyushu. This planned landing required almost 1,000 ships and over 300,000 men. Military analysts estimated American casualties at 1 million men. What did the committee recommend? Well, some scientists on the committee thought it might be a good idea to do a demonstration, detonating one of the atomic bombs for a few delegates from the United Nations. But if this demonstration failed, it would be a wasted opportunity. Therefore, the committee ultimately concluded that the best possible option on the table was military use of the bomb. And based on that recommendation, and after much deliberation, Truman decided to go forward with military use. Mm. So, so what happened next? Well, Truman went to the Potsdam Conference that began on July 17th of 1945, one day after the Trinity test happened in New Mexico. And while he was there, he worked with the other Allied leaders, Joseph Stalin from the Soviet Union and Winston Churchill from the United Kingdom, and together they drafted the Potsdam Declaration. And in this declaration, they called for Japan's unconditional surrender. Meanwhile, Leslie Groves was compiling a list of cities in Japan that could serve as potential targets. This declaration was delivered to Japan on July 26, 1945, but it was met with silence. Meanwhile, the parts for both bombs were either ferried or flown to Tinian Island, where final bomb assembly took place. Once complete, the bombs were loaded onto heavy B-29 bomber planes that took off for Japan. So, when exactly were the bombs dropped? On the early morning hours of August 6, 1945, 11 days after Japan received the Potsdam Declaration, a B-29 bomber called the Enola Gay took off from Tinian Island and headed for Hiroshima, Japan. At approximately 9.15 in the morning, a gun-method uranium bomb exploded 2,000 feet above the city of Hiroshima, and it exploded above the city in order to maximize its impact. And the bomb's resulting blast was the equivalent of roughly 15,000 tons of TNT. The bomb destroyed five miles of the city and resulted in approximately 140,000 deaths. In the days after, the Japanese government did not meet to discuss the surrender term of the Potsdam Conference, but the Japanese foreign minister tried to arrange a meeting with the Soviet Union to mediate negotiations for a surrender. However, the Soviet Union declared war on Japan on August 9th, three days after the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. What were the effects on the ground? Well, Jasmine, for this, I think it would be good if we took a look at some of the historical footage from the museum's collection.
Jasmine, let's take a look at an artifact from one of the bomb sites. Here we have the vase that was recovered by Lieutenant E.L. Wiley from Nagasaki. What do you notice about this vase? There are some black spots covering this side of the vase, but they're not on the other side. That's right. Those black spots are flash burns caused by the intense heat that came from the detonation of the atomic bomb. And you can tell that this side of the vase was facing the atomic bomb at the moment of the blast, whereas the other one was not. And that just shows you the intensity of the heat and the reactive causes and the devastating effect made by the atomic bomb. So where exactly does this leave Japan? Well, after the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Emperor of Japan, Hirohito, finally accepted the conditions of the Potsdam Declaration. So on August 15, 1945, he announced Japan's surrender via a radio broadcast, which was known as the Jeweled Voice broadcast because this was the first time that many people in Japan had ever heard the Emperor's voice. But it's worth noting that throughout the entirety of his speech, he never once used the word surrender. Let's take a walk to the end of the gallery to look at some iconic footage from the end of World War II. What's going on here? So here we see some footage from the signing of the surrender document. And this happened on the deck of the battleship USS Missouri. Uh, and this happened September 2nd, 1945. And as you can see in the footage, we have both officials from the United States and also from Japan who were present for the signing of this document. The moment this document was signed, Japan fell under the power of the Supreme Commander of the Allied Powers, and that was General Douglas MacArthur. From this point on, the United States would occupy Japan, and Japan would remain under U.S. occupation until 1952. As the story of World War II comes to a close, in some ways, the story of atomic energy is just beginning. We'll find out more in the next segment.